Hey there, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Michael Blanc. Really excited that you're here. Now, you're probably listening, watching this, thinking that, hey, I want to be a real estate investor, or maybe you're saying I am a real estate investor, and that may be the case, but you're actually in two businesses, whether you like it or not. You're in the real estate investing business because you're looking for deals, you're analyzing deals, you're making offers, you're raising money, you're managing. But on the other hand, you're also in the marketing and promotion business. Here's the thing, you can raise $500,000 or a million dollars just by word of mouth, and plenty of people do. But once you start tapping out your personal network, you're gonna try to wonder, what do I need to do to attract more capital? And this is where you need to become a promoter. And so people who have been successful raising money, they scratch their heads going, my gosh, how do I do this? And that is when they have to start entering the world of promotion and marketing. And really at the heart of it is you have to build what I call a platform. A platform is something that you know in the old days you could stand on the stage and that way you can project your voice and reach a larger audience. In today's modern world, we do this in a variety of ways. We have a podcast or we write a book or we go to meetups or we have a website. And there's all these different things that we need to do in order to attract uh, more people to ourselves. And even if you're not a real estate investor, you're doing anything else, you have a message inside you that you want to get to the millions, you know, you have a product you want to sell, a, a, a service you want to provide, you want to change people's lives, you have to get good at promoting yourself. It does no good having a fantastic service or product and no one knows about it. You know, I kind of joke with, I'm involved in this Uganda ministry and we do all these great things uh, in in the middle of nowhere, Uganda, where um, uh, the, the, the organization is called Uganda Counseling Support Services, or UCSS, and the executive director founder is Ronald Kaluuya, and he does all these great things that were, that makes these people self-sufficient. So we don't, you know, build them a house, we show them how to build a house so they can do it themselves, for example. And we do all these things that, that literally permanently transform these people, but then he doesn't tell anyone right? There's no blog post. There's no videos. It's almost like a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it. So does it really fall in the woods? Well, yeah, actually it does, but no one knows about it. So did it really happen? Do you know what I mean? So now as of the last year, he's gotten a lot better as putting out blog posts and videos so that the story can be told. And the same thing for us. We have to be able to tell the story. We have to be promote our product or service. In this case, if you're raising capital, for example, you have a fantastic product. It's called multifamily syndications, right? And your audience is anyone who's ever invested in the stock market and they were looking for consistent returns and they're looking for cash flow they're, and, they're, and they're looking for ways to pay less taxes. Well, you have a great product, which is investing in multifamily syndications. The missing gap is the promotional piece. So you're going to hear me a lot more talking about building a platform over the coming months is something that's very, very very much misunderstood and it's a, a major gap in the active syndicators toolbox. It's just not there. So we're gonna talk a lot about that. And I would say almost to kick things off is I have someone on the show today who basically build massive platforms. You know Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn, these guys in the 90s built massive platforms and the guy who built Jim Rohn International spent 18 years promoting Jim Rohn is my mentor, Kyle Wilson. And I'm really honored to have him on the podcast today because he's going to talk about how he did that, not just in the 90s, but he's doing it again now in today's time. And his philosophy is very much aligned with mine. And we'll talk about that. It's, it's a lot about how do I serve the audience? How do Who's my audience? How do I serve that audience? How do I provide that audience a value? And then how do I lead them towards transformation? Right. In my case is how do I inspire, motivate you to uh, uh, take action, to get into apartment buildings and so that you can achieve financial freedom. Right. So I'm trying to educate you and motivate you so you can quit your jobs. Right. So how do you do that? What's the best way to do it? Kyle's come on the show. He's going to talk about that. He's also talked about stuff he's learned working with Jim Rohn. He also worked with Brian Tracy. He knows that the man knows everyone. He is a networker. He's a connector. He knows a lot of people. And I'm just really honored to have him on the show. So without any further ado, let's get in the show with Kyle Wilson. Kyle Wilson, welcome to the show today. Michael, good to be here. Well, this is really, really cool. I'm so glad that you're on this call with me because you've been really instrumental in, in my career. 
Uh, you're a mentor of mine, a personal friend now, I would say, and you have such an unbelievable wealth of experience. And we just want to kind of peel back the onions because your story is fascinating. The things you've learned are fascinating. The things you're doing right now and going to be doing are going to be fascinating. So I, I know that you have a long career with Jim Rohn, you know, the guys who hung out with Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn, 18 years you spent with him. You've worked with Brian Tracy, Mark Victor Hansen, Darren Hardy. I mean, you worked with some really big players. And how did you even get started with all that stuff? Well, Michael, thank you. I, I so value our friendship and, and value you coming into my, my world. And you bring so much value to me. And I got to speak at your event a year and a half ago. And that was amazing. You put on the best events. You have the best people. And so, you know, it's really about culture. But yeah, how I got started, go back 30 years ago, hard to believe 30 years ago, uh, is when I got in the seminar business. And actually, you know, I grew up in a small town, never went to college, uh, didn't do very well in school, got in a lot of trouble. You know, we're talking drugs, the whole thing. And I changed my life at age 19, started a little business, a detail shop, you know, washing cars right. that eventually turned into a service station. And I mean, just to tell you what, uh, you know, people that believe in, uh, you know, God ordained things, I feel like my story is that because how I went from small town, detail shop, service station to, you know, being Jim Rohn's 18 year business partner is, is kind of crazy. But age 26, I really felt called to sell my house, sell my business and move to Dallas, move from my 13,000 person Vernon, Texas to Dallas, did not have anything lined up. I thought I would do another detail shop, washing cars. And, uh, you know, I ended up attending the seminar and the guy promoting the seminar uh, through a whole series of serendipitous circumstances we don't have time to go through, ended up offering me a job. And I had never spoken in front of people. I'd never cold called. And the key to that job was you had to make 100 cold calls a day to book yourself to go speak at companies to then sell tickets. So imagine speaking in front of a car dealership or in front of a real estate office of agents. It's kind of a tough crowd, actually. You go in to speak for free, to share ideas, to then sell tickets. But actually, I just was committed and I decided I was going to make this happen. And I went for it. And within six months, then he was able to go reconnect with Jim Rohn and bring Jim Rohn into what we were doing. And I was his top guy and I started running the state of Texas and putting on these three, 400 people seminars. Uh, at the end of the day though, the model was broke that he had. And so I wasn't making any money. I'm the top guy not making any money. So I left the company, went to start my own company. And with my new company, my goal was to get 2000 people in a room. And I would go to Washington DC, go to Chicago, go to Atlanta, not know one person. And 90 days later, I've got 2,000, 2,500 people in the room. And I would hire Brian Tracy or Jim Rohn or Og Mandino, two of those three speakers. And we got so good at it. We had, we built lifestyle around what we were doing because I've now been mentored by Jim. And uh, 1993, uh, Jim's partner uh, had now owed him over uh, $400,000. The model was so broken. So Jim said that they had broke, broke up, they're not together. So I said, Jim, I think you're the best speaker in the world. I'm a pretty good promoter. And I, I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. And I started Jim Rohn International. And that first year I took him from 20 speaking dates at 4,000 to 110 dates at 10,000, then eventually 25,000. So I had to now go from seminar promoter to agent, marketer, and then started creating products, and we'll talk about that, but over 300 intellectual properties, and then started your success store, because once everyone would buy Jim Rohn's stuff, then what? So I now started selling Brian Tracy and uh, John Maxwell and Zig Ziglar's, and then, then the internet came around uh, 1999, and I was the first guy to go build a million plus list, and we had an amazing company. I mean, 20 employees just shipping products, and uh, you know the, the game's changed since then, right? But that's factor in CDs and DVDs and such. Yeah, the game has certainly changed. Um, but one thing you had is you had a really, really strong product with, with Jim Rohn, who was just, right. just amazing. I mean, the wisdom the man had, uh, you know, is timeless. And so the product you had was really, really powerful. But in order to do the things you've done, you obviously built a, a must have built in a very large platform, which 
that the details and the technical details of that may, may have shifted. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but one of the things I think it also allows you to do is you, you, got, you got to hang around this guy, Jim right. Rohn, right? And right. so that's pretty cool. And I mean, he's got like a hundred and well, you put that as a little quote book, I think you gave to <laughs> right. me, this blue quote book with all of his quotes in it, which is really right. cool. There's so many things you could have possibly learned from, from Jim. What are some of the things that, that really stood out for you? Yeah, I want to dive into that. And I will go back to what you were saying, though. Uh, prior to me and Jim, though, Jim wasn't selling products. He only had a couple. He wasn't doing large events. So I will say talent is one thing, but marketing is a totally different thing. And so a lot of people think, and so I think they're both, you know, I, the, the, the talent's the most important thing, but then you have to add the marketing to it. There was a before and an after, and we're going to talk about the after and how we did it because everything I did applies to today because it's all very principle based. Yeah. But yes, met Jim Rohn at age 27. And, you know, I could go on and on about the things that changed my life, but four come to mind. I always talk about these four. Number one, Jim said that the major key to your better future is you. He said, it's not the government. It's not the president. It's not the economy. It's not interest rates or cap rates or who your parents are or any of that. It's you. And that's something, you know, we hear, but we kind of take it for granted. But at the end of the day, he's 100% right. Uh, the things that are the most important things to our success, we get to control. Our attitude, our thoughts. If we're going to watch mindless TV or if we're going to listen to a podcast, if we're going to go to events, if we're going to read a book that could change our life. And so I took that to heart at 27 and I said, okay, maybe that's possible. Maybe I could really, you know, change my whole life by these things, regardless of how crazy the marketplace was and how I was at the bottom of the, of the equation of being promoters. The second thing he said was success was predictable, you know, and I'm like, okay. And so he's like, if you have a garden and you're going to plant tomatoes or a vineyard or whatever it is, it's predictable. And so I think we've both found that to be true. Success, there's typically a blueprint. And if you'll follow the blueprint, it is predictable. Now, what most people do, and one of the reasons I don't like to call myself a marketer, because marketers are the worst at actually creating part of the problem. Most people go for the quick fix. They want the immediate answer. They want the shortcut. But the reality is if they'll follow the blueprint, and it's going to take time, it's going to take, you know, patience, but if they follow the blueprint, success is guaranteed more times than not, hmm. more times than not. Sometimes things are going to go wrong. Some things, sometimes things you can't control. But once I realized it was predictable, I had faith. I had a belief system. The third thing he taught me is to be a student, not a follower. You know, sometimes we think, okay, we're following this person. So we got a 100% follow, or we can't, listen to what someone else says because maybe philosophically or spiritually or whatever, we're not in alignment. But Jim said, Hey, take it all in and then decide what you want to use and discard the rest. And so it really allowed me to kind of open up my horizons and go become a student, take it all in. But realizing at the end of the day, uh, he said, take, you know, don't take orders, you know, only do what you feel like you're supposed to do. So at the end of the day, it was my decision of what I was gonna do, and so that was powerful. And then the fourth thing, and this is probably a big chunk of my success, he said, if you wanna be successful, learn to bring value to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. He said, if you learn, wanna be wealthy, learn to bring value to valuable people. But it all begins with bringing value. That's the first thing you have to do in every equation. You know, whether it's uh, having a podcast, whether it's having an online product, whether it's trying to get prospects turned into customers, how can you bring value? And so that's the beginning place. So I, that's how I would approach everything, Michael, was how can I bring value? And so the first thing when I would meet someone was not how can I network, not how I can win them over, but how can I bring value? And if I can bring value and it's the right fit for them, good things would happen. Yeah, you do. You're, you're so good at that, uh, Kyle, both in you know, the emails you put out, the blog posts you put out, but also in your personal interactions, right? You're constantly, you're trying to understand the person. You're trying to understand, hey, what does this person need? What are they looking for? And then you're constantly hooking me up with people. Like, I love that, <laughs> right? And, and, and you're right. And you're like, that Kyle, right? He's really, he's unbelievable, right? And, and with that, then you build trust with that, with that person. 
And now, you know, one, one point down, you can ask, right? If you, if you just do stuff and you provide value at one point, it gives you permission to ask for something, you know, what, call it what you, what you will. You build up so much goodwill around that. Now, certainly marketing has changed quite a bit. And I remember there was a time in early 2000s where marketing was all about direct response marketing, right? It's like they put out an ad, buy, 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 and it worked like crazy. And that stopped working like, you know, five, seven years ago. And, uh, you know, you've kind of taken all this in because you've built million plus uh, subscribers. You've had 2,000 in, in a room. Ta talk to us about kind of your marketing principles. Like what, what, do you, what can you share about how to properly market? And I think market is kind of a, they have a negative connotation, but you know what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. So for me, I talk about these seven marketing principles to build your business and your brand. And I could spend days talking about it. But just the cliff notes are number one, marketing is just about connecting the dots. It's not about being manipulative. It's not about being clever. So many people, you know, we do think of marketing in bad terms, but for me, it's always been about connecting the dots. And I'll share here in a little bit about how I connected the dots with Jim Rohn, right? Nothing changed with Jim. His message didn't change. Not one thing changed. I just connected the dots between what his secret sauce was what the marketplace was, what the competition was, what his goals were, what I was good at. <clears throat> and we connected those dots. And then I said, let's go build from that. So that's number one, marketing, simply connecting the dots between the most efficient, effective way to connect up with a prospect and a, and a client. Uh, you, you have to go back to that. You have to go back to connecting the dots with Jim Rohn. So we understand that. So number one is connecting the dots. Right. Okay. And so I'll get to that on number okay. four. Okay. okay. Yeah. But number two, Good. marketing's about tactics and principles. So tactics are constantly changing, right? Technology changes the tactics. So whether it's email, podcasts, social media, direct mail, events, uh, just how you sequence everything, all those are tactics and tactics are important and they change. And I'm happy to say I was successful way before the internet. I was filling up rooms in an antiquated way. I was one of the top guys. And then I was filling up rooms after the internet. And then I sold all my companies in 2007, but I came back out three or four years ago and since then have put on some big events as well. So you're constantly having to shift. You're constantly having to say what's new, what's now, what's next, right? But those are tactics. But on the other side are principles. And principles don't change. And principles basically are relationships. In fact, I would say number one principle of marketing is have a great product. You know, that's number one. If you have a great product that people then want to refer you and they become advocates, that's what I'm always in search of. I'm in search of people that have something that people want. It's like, okay, I can build with that. If someone has something no one wants, no, I can't help you, right? I'm not going to be able to bring value. You have to find something that people want. It's got to be a great product. Number two, great customer service. You gotta take care of your people. Again, two companies, one, you know, Nordstrom's or these different companies, uh, Chewy, that people rave about, and then other companies that spend hundreds of millions of dollars on marketing, everyone hates because their customer service sucks. Well, same way with us, you know, down in the trenches, we have to have a great product, we have to have great customer service. Number three, you gotta be consistent. You know, I had like eight newsletters going at one time. I was also Dennis Waitley's agent, Jim Rohn's agent, Ron White, uh, Chris Widener. I had your success store. I had Jim Rohn International. I had the, the Success and Training Network. And we were very consistent in how we put out uh, information. So being consistent. And then number four, the most important, is being relational. And I always say never let a good tactic override a principle. So people come to me all the time with tactics. And I'll say, no, thank you, because I don't want to be treated the way you're wanting to sell me on a tactic that you think works. Yes, it might work, but is it, you know, how's that going to work out in the end? And I see people all the time churn through people. My goal is not to churn through people. And that's where we're going to get to the will in a minute, which is very different than funnels. Uh, but that's number two. So number three is being strategic. And so when I say strategic, I'm always saying, what's the one thing that if you did it would knock down all the rest of the dominoes, right? So for me as a seminar promoter, I'm going into a city, I don't know one person, Michael, there's 50 ways I can get people to an event. I can put 
but business cards on windshields. And I've done it, right? I've done every kind of thing you could think of. But at the end of the day, there's a few things that are going to work the most. Well, same thing with each one of our businesses. And we got to discover what is that one thing that's going to knock down the dominoes. And I've discovered that probably within six months of starting to work with Jim, I came up with that one thing that would knock down the dominoes. So I'm about to get to that. Uh, number four is the wheel. And this is my core philosophy, right? So the wheel, I created this in 1993. It's, you know, draw a circle and in the center is a hub. And then each spoke is your product and services. So I created this wheel in 1993. I said, what are Jim Rohn's product and services? He had a one day seminar, a two day seminar. He had a book and audio series. And I said, okay, the most important thing about the wheel is how do you get people on the wheel? And then once they're on it, how do you take them around it? So if I, if I meet you and you get on the wheel, you might not care about a seminar, but you might want a book or you might want an audio series. So there's no agenda. The key is I just have to build a relationship with you and put out what you want. I think a podcast is a great example of the wheel because you get to put out a lot of good stuff and people pick. They say, hey, Michael, I want your online program. I want to be part of your mastermind. I want to go to your event in Dallas or your event in D.C., right? There's not, a, there's not, it's not like an email sequence where there's an agenda. It's the wheel. And you just put out good stuff. And when people are ready and you give them occasionally things to raise their hand for, you know, that's how that works. And so the big key was what new spoke would I add for Jim Rohn? Well, my most, uh, when I'm thinking about the wheel, I have four things. Or when I'm thinking about a new spoke, number one, is it part of your core business? So if you're going to add a new spoke to get more people on the wheel and take them around and be strategic, number one, is it part of your core business? Number two, is it part of your secret sauce? Is it what you're really good at? With Jim Rohn, I said, okay, what's Jim amazing at? He was a wordsmith. You know, he had so many quotes. And, you know, and here's the other thing. People loved him. You know, he, I, you know people love Zig. People love Brian Tracy. But they really, really love Jim Rohn. So I said, okay, what can I create that would feed that, right? Because I want to, I want to separate Jim from everyone else. Because at the time, no one really knew who Jim Rohn was. It was like 1% of 1% of 1%. How do I know? Because I did thousands of meetings selling tickets. And they knew who uh, Earl Nottingale was. They knew who Tony Robbins was. They, you know, they knew uh, uh, even Les Brown, but they didn't know who Jim Rohn was. So I, I said, okay, it's Jim's quotes. So I went through all his seminars and his books, his book and his audio series, and came up with almost a thousand quotes. That's how prolific Jim is. And I created a hardbound book called The Treasury of Quotes. And I never carry these around. You're part of my inner circle. I never carry them around, but I'll have one Thursday for you, okay? It's a hardbound book and 365 quotes. But I created that just so I could create this. And it was called the excerpts from the treasury of quotes. And it was 110 quotes. And I thought, okay, his secret sauce is people love him. How can I get the people that love him to become advocates and go pass this out? So I put a to and from, I put a phenomenal quote by Jim and I left room for him to, to write notes. And then of course I put my catalog in the back and I put how people could order these in, in quantity, big quantities. And instead of selling them for five bucks each, I mean, it's leather bound or leather, 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 it's gold foil. I sold them for a dollar each. Now, if you bought one, it was $2, but you could buy 10 for a dollar each. And I taught people how to buy them and give them out, how to put their sticker on it. And, you know, how I would envision it, Michael, and this is way before I even created it, was no one's just going to throw you a quote book, right? They're going to give a commercial. They're going to say, you ever heard of Jim Rohn? And they'd open it up and tell a quote. Learn to be happy with what you have while you pursue all that you want. And maybe even go to the catalog and say, hey, Seasons of Life, I bought 50 of those for Christmas last year. And then they would hand it to you. And after that booklet came out, 70% uh, of our phone calls that would come to our office would say, how'd you get our number? Someone would say, someone gave me a quote book. So it was beautiful for network marketing, for real estate, for insurance. And I ended up moving 6 million of those. But it was all based on this thing called the wheel and being strategic, right? What one thing is going to knock down the dominoes. Now, from that quote book, again, it, it's, it's, it's one of those miracle stories, Michael. It's like back in the day, 
from the time I started getting these out in the marketplace, within a week, my mailbox would be full of orders. And our phones were ringing off the hook of people wanting to buy the product or buy a hundred quilt books. So even way back then, I don't think I was the first, but I might have been the first. I started doing uh, Christmas in September and I would go out to my list. You know, I built this million plus list. So 2000, 2001, 2002, I'm going out and saying, hey, Christmas in September, I'm about to place a huge order of quote books. If you go ahead and order now, you not only get a discount, we'll, we'll give you the, the, the printed labels with your name on them that you can include. And I would sell hundreds of thousands of those. Now, here's the thing. I actually made a profit. <clears throat> I would print those for 30, 35 cents back in the day. But the biggest thing was I had people out getting my message out. I had advocates, right? And that's what you want. So that's a big, you know, it's a big piece of marketing right there. And again, there's three more, but we'll stop there for now. And that's awesome. Uh, that's really awesome. I think a few things that stuck with me is it's very relational, strategic, relational. Don't let the tactic override the relational. And, and this is, this has happened to me as well. There are certain tactics you use that are very aggressive. They unfortunately work very well, but they do come at the expense of the relationship. And you also have to ask yourself, is that kind of consistent with your brand? So re right. relational is, is everything. And uh, the other thing that, that you've, you've said is building value. You're constantly building value. Now, even though the, the, in these quote books was a perfect example of that because when someone hands out that quote book, it costs them a dollar, but they're handing out lots of wisdom to somebody. So now they look right. great, right? So you've, you've given someone value and they in turn can now provide that value to somebody else. So it's, it's like the, the perfect viral marketing campaign. So exactly, I, <clears throat> I love that. And I like how these things are, like you said, they're principles. They're not tactics. They don't, they, they should never change because you should always be relational. You should all always be providing value for, for your audience. Now, having said that, there are, I'm sure, some things that are, are different uh, back when you were doing this in the 90s, maybe even early yeah. 2000s versus now. What are, some of the, what are some of the big differences that you're seeing now versus maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago? Sure. And I, I do want to say I, the quote books, I created one for Mark Victor Hansen, Brian Tracy, Dennis Waitley, uh, uh, Zig Ziglar. And all combined of those, I sold $2 million, all combined. And I sold six of Jim because it got back to his secret sauce. Mm. So when I'm inviting people to discover what that next thing would be, they got, you know, the quote book didn't exist. That idea was kind of like a God download. So that was a self discovery thing. So when I tell people, what is that next spoke? You got to take a step back. I wasn't the first guy to start, you know, like a Jim Rohn. I, I did Jim Rohn International, but there was Jim Rohn Productions. There was all these other attempts and every one of them went bankrupt. They kept trying to do the same thing over and over and over again. I truly did innovate, but I did it based on his secret sauce. Mm. So I could give you a ton of examples of people we know, the real estate guys are one, multiple different people, uh, Erica Dela Cruz and Passionistas, where again, we went to discover what that secret sauce was and then build upon it. Uh, you know, what's changed today is just obviously the tactics, right? And um, I, I've, seen, I've seen the shift happen. I think, um, you know, YouTube, so like 2000, in my world, uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, the big shift went from selling commodity products, you know, like books, tapes, CDs, to now it's all free. So everything is free uh, one way or another. <clears throat> and so how you would create value in my world was you had to be the authority or the coach, right? And uh, so online programs have slowly, I think, uh, disintegrated a little bit because again, everything's so free. So ultimately, people are paying for your time and wisdom and value. So you see a lot of high-end type of events, a lot of high-end coaching, uh, unfortunately. And it's the same as it's always been. You're always competing against uh, the people who have never done it that are screaming the loudest. One reason I don't have an online program is I don't want to scream that loud to overcome people that have never done anything, right? They read a book and they're regurgitating a book. So I bring my value within higher, higher things like Manor Circle or my book programs. That's where then I have, you know, what, you know, the wisdom I feel like I have and the value of what I have. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, like when I got back 
in this four or five years ago, the first thing I said was social media is where I have to start. I didn't want to, right? I, when I sold my companies, I kind of put my ego to the side and I retired and I thought I was done for life. And when I came back out, having to go, you know, realize building the email list was going to be difficult in the beginning without social media. So I think, you know, social media was one big shift. But at the end of the day, you still want to get people on an email list. If you have a podcast, if you have social media, you don't own it, right? You don't own Facebook. Uh, example I give is Tom Ziegler with, you know, really good friend of mine. They have 5 million people on their Ziegler Facebook group. And he would get 100,000, 200,000 likes. And I'm like, Tom, you got to get those people onto an email list. He said, no, nah, this is beautiful, right? And sure enough, Facebook changed the algorithm. And after three iterations of that, now they get 500 likes. They went from 100,000 to 500. Don't think that's not going to happen with Instagram, right? Instagram's owned by Facebook. So the number one thing is if you have platforms on social media, you got to get those people onto an email list. And uh, Seth Mosley, uh, two-time Grammy winner, 30 years old, you know, songwriter of the year, producer of the year, he started an online uh, songwriter course uh, a year ago. And he said the biggest thing that shocked him when, you know, we were coaching way ahead of time before he launched it was when I said, you got to have an email list because his audience is millennials and Gen Z, right? It's this 18 year old to 24 year old. <clears throat> and he didn't think they had email. And he said, sure enough, that's where most of the sales still came from was email. So social media uh, is a powerful platform, but you also want to try and get those people on email. And email is more difficult than it's ever been, but it is the one thing you get to control, right? So whether it's a podcast, social media, the key is to get them onto your email list. And I see that mistake being made all the time. I just, uh, <laughs> I met with, with, uh, with these two people, they were starting a podcast and I applaud them. And I asked them, you know, do you have a way to build your email? Do we have a lead magnet of some sort? Right. And they're like, what is that? I'm like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> you know, so they, they basically put the cart before the her horse. They start promoting themselves without actually knowing, being able to control who that is. And Facebook is a perfect example, right? That algorithm change was devastating to a lot of people. And, and now you got to- over time. And I guarantee you, Instagram's going to do the same sure. thing. And, you know, the big thing is, I call that connecting the dots. Again, uh, having a podcast still is very much a marketing-centric, type of thing, right? And it's just simply connecting the dots. Yeah, it's connecting the dots. So for sure. You mentioned the secret sauce a couple of times. I don't want to gloss over that because I know it's something that you spend a lot of time. What is the secret sauce and why is it so important? Yeah, it's what makes you unique and special. Uh, I'll go look at someone's website and they'll have a bunch of graphics up there of something anyone could put up there, right? Either, there's a hundred million people uh, out there that could put the same graphics up. What I want to see when I go to a website, in fact, there's four things I want to see at the top of the fold. If you don't mind me just jumping into that, I want number one, a mystique. And that mystique needs to involve you. You know, I need to see a picture of you and something that somehow represents your personality and your brand and what makes you special. Number two, I want to see two to three to four different um, taglines of what you're really good at. And Again, for me, I could have a lot of different taglines. You know, I've done Chicken Soup for the Entrepreneur's Soul, Jim Rohn, Creative Products. So I have to pick two or three that I think will fit my avatar, right? So pick the two or three or four <clears throat> that's going to actually talk to your most focused avatar you're trying to reach. But they also need to represent your secret sauce. Number three, I want to see some social proof and testimonials, again, that are going to impress your uh, avatar and number four, I want to opt in, a way for people to, you know, opt into what you're doing. And mine, I'm, I'm proud of mine. And we're going to tell people at the end how they can go to my website. But, you know, I'm proud of how mine looks. It's not just a simple little, you know, opt-in. So you want to be creative. And here's the thing, Michael, you know, we live 24-7, uh, you know, on, through social media and our website. Jeffrey Gittimer was at my Philly Inner Circle. And Jeffrey said, Kyle, where do you live? And I said, well, you know where I live. I'm in, I'm in Texas. He goes, no, you're going to give out your address to people. I'm like, no. And he goes, okay, you live on your website. 
He said, your website needs to represent you, my friend. It is the 24 seven business card. And that's true for social media. So that's why your website's so important. And when I ask people, how do you feel about your website? Maybe 10% raise their hand that they feel good about it. So I'm, I'm kind of redirecting your question on secret sauce to say, find out what you're great at and make sure that's represented on your website. So again, if you're phenomenal with numbers, if you're the accountability person, if you're the detailed person, if you're the person people can trust, let your web, website say that. If you're the deal finder, if you're the person that knows how to raise money, you know, if you have all these phenomenal relationships and uh, social proof, or you've had a best selling book, or you're doing events, or you have these cool pictures with Robert Kiyosaki or whatever, I do want to see that because that might make you different than what anyone else could put up there. Yeah, that's, that's so true. So it's all about the list building and the way you do it is via your website and some kind of free giveaway. Now you mentioned these uh, 52 lessons that you have, and we'll talk about that in a second before we talk about that, because I think it'd be instructive for the listeners and watchers to learn how you do that, how you actually use it. But before we get to that, your 52 sure. lessons from Jim Rohn and, and other basically famous people are really cool because every week you're sending out some lesson at once a week for the entire year. And it's super awesome. Uh, what are some of the like major lessons that that really stand out for you that uh, you yeah, that you that you mail out to people? Yeah, and and uh, let me share on the marketing side first. So the marketing side was I wanted to have something that would be attractive, that someone would want, that also had hooks. So mine is fifty two lessons from uh, Jim Rohn and other legends. I promote it, and then the ta the sub is you know Darren Hardy, Brian Tracy. Uh, Mark Victor Hansen, you know, all these different names that have different hooks, Phil Collin, a Def Leppard. So I'm trying to create hooks that people go, oh, wow. Um, and I have examples of that. And so I wrote it once a week. So I started my opt-in back, you know, three or four years ago, but I would write them once a week. I didn't go write all 52 and then right. offer it. So it's a weekly lesson. So that's a little trick. If you want to create something, you don't have it. And it's 12 weeks of something, you can, you can have a weekly deadline and just automate it. Yes, so many great lessons. Uh, you know, the very first lesson is by Jim Rohn and it, it talks about it takes time to build something great. Anything of value is going to take time. And he said the twin killers of success are greed and impatience. And just realize it's going to take time and realize what you're trying to create. If you want to create a great vineyard, it's going to take five or six years, right? If you want to be a con archer, it's going to take 10 or 20 years. So it depends what you want to create and just realize it's going to take time. I have a rule of 18 months and I get that fed back to me all the time. Three times this week, someone from my inner circle came back and said, wow, it finally happened. I finally made that deal or I finally whatever. And you know what? It was about 18 months. And so there, it, it's just something magical about, I, in fact, I like to reflect a lot of times in 18 month segments. Um, another one of my favorite lessons was like 1992. I'm at Brian Tracy's house. I'm promoting him around the country. And he said, Kyle, you know, you don't have kids yet. Uh, you're a newlywed or not a newlywed. I've been married three or four years. He said, you know, I really encourage you to pay the price you know, before you have kids, like the next two or three years, really pay the price. He said, it's like getting a plane off the ground. He said, all the fuel it takes to get the, you know, you're going 80 miles an hour down the runway, but yet it's using up more fuel than it is if you're going 500 miles an hour in the air. The key is to get the plane off the ground in the air. And he said, most people spend their whole life on the runway going 80 miles an hour because they're never truly willing to pay the price. And, you know, I got to say, I did pay that price. And uh, that price is what allowed me to very quickly move on to a next level where I could do things faster, easier, because I did build the platform, right? And so sometimes you have to pay a price early on. It's not forever. And make sure it's not forever. Make sure that, uh, you know, it's calculated. But if you're going to try and win the Olympics, or you're going to try and be a professional athlete, there is a price to pay for a period of time. An another good one. Uh, I'll share two, two really quick ones. 
uh, Zig Ziglar said, never do a good deal with a bad guy. I got to tell you, that has kept me out of lawsuits. That's kept me out of uh, business divorces. Um, you know, regardless of how it's kind of like the tactics and principles, same thing here, regardless of how good the deal looks, if it's with the wrong person, just say no. You know, I, I think I've kind of graduated where I got to be careful when I say that. It's not a temptation. You know, I don't, I don't really want, it, the, there's a big thing right now that's just like massive, but I just don't want to work with the guy. Life's too important, right? Life's too enjoyable to get in, in that person's cluster F, right? And so <clears throat> that was huge for me. I, I really adhered to that. And the other was Dennis Whaley. You know, Dennis said, hey, I've written 18 number one best-selling books, and I wrote them all at night. He said, my day job is I'm a speaker. I travel the world speaking. He said, but I wrote my books at night during most people's prime time TV time. You know, and Jim Rohn would talk about having uh, a day job and then having a side hustle. So most of, most of my mentors talked about you have a job and then you have a side hustle. I think oftentimes two pe people too quickly leave their job to go full time in their side hustle when they haven't created the, you know, maybe the financial security. <clears throat> I'm not trying to judge that, but you know, there, there are a lot of great examples of things that were built through the, he called it prime time. So I would always say prime time is big time is the name of that uh, 52 lesson. Yeah. Side hustle is, is so important. I think what you said is, you know, pay the price now so you don't have to, down the road. Like it's like with every, it's that delayed gratification. I'm going to work really hard for the next three years so that I can essentially take my foot off the gas a little bit and relax. And then I can do whatever I want really at that, at that point. Right. And it's like that with financial freedom with apartment buildings. Oh, you're going to work your butt off for the next 12, 18, 24 months. And then, and then you have options, right? Then you can do what you want. Now, speaking of what you, what you're doing, what you want, you had built a pretty successful business. You sold it and you retired. Why in the world did you come out of retirement, Kyle? <laughs> it's a good question. You know, I, I was a Mr. Mom for eight years. And, uh, so, you know, I, I remember, and, and I'll be totally candid here, I did get involved in day trading and things like that. And I remember being so stressed. And a lot of the things that, um, I, I, I just remember having one month where it's like I was almost, the opposite of happy, you know, I, whatever that is. Right. And I thought, okay, I'm going to be open to getting back in the personal development space. And I gave myself a month and I started reaching out to people like Darren Hardy and Brian Tracy, and Mark Victor Hansen and Jeffrey Gittimer. And it just had such amazing energy. And they all said, yeah, jump in, dude, Let, let's do this. Let's put something together. And then I started doing these little masterminds. I went on a ski trip with Darren Hardy and John Asaraf of The Secret and a couple other guys. And they were all part of a San Diego mastermind. And I really just felt out of place. And they're like, dude, you gotta go start your own. Go back to Dallas and start your own. So I invited Robert Helms of the Real Estate Guys, if your audience knows Robert. He spoke at your incredible event in July. And Ron White, who's been on your podcast and uh, some of these longtime friends. And I started this little mastermind and it was so fulfilling and I really love what I'm doing now. Like I, I really love what I'm doing. Why? But that took a, what's that? Why do you love what you're doing? I think, uh, first of all, I think I'm helping people. Like it's, uh, what part of the secret sauce, you asked me about that and I didn't go into the detail I should have, but there's a six column exercise and I can rip through it fast. But one, you know, number one is, uh, what are you good at? Number two, is what you enjoy. They're different sometimes. You might be really good at cooking, but you don't enjoy it. Or you might suck at cooking, but you love it, right? So number one's what you're good at. Number two is like, what are your hobbies, your passions? What do you, what do you love and enjoy? Number three, or what, is, what are your successes? What have you had success at in the past? Number four is how other people see you. Like a lot of people see me as a connector. I, I see myself as a guy that built this freaking incredible company and you know, had all these employees and the agent and they say, no, you're a connector. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. That's how people see you. Number five though, is what are you for? What do you, what is it that you're passionate about, which is different than your hobbies? Like, what do you, and then number six is what are you against? 
And part of what I was against was watching people spend 10, 20, 30, 50,000 to go get a book done or to go create an online course that actually cost them even more money. If someone overpaid to get something done, that's fine, you know, uh, but to pay and go the wrong direction. And I watched it over and over and over again. And so that kind of got me back in the game because I'm out here pontificating, but I wasn't doing anything about it. And so I started taking on some coaching clients and started doing the books. The, the Passionista book was a total, uh, in fact, Erica, it's changed her life. That, that was 40 millennial women in this book that was a pure passion project. You know, I didn't make any money. And I did two or three of those books like that, but I really helped these um, co-authors build a brand and hit number one and, and teach them to market. Yeah, that's and, right. We did one of these. This is the book that I yeah. was in, uh, Resilience. Yes. See, Such right, a good where I'm right here. And I, th I think this is brilliant, uh, Kyle, because not only do you know how to publish books, but it helps the people in this book uh, establish credibility. So yeah, everyone watching, listen, we're going to, we're going to do one of these books for, uh, <laughs> for capital raisers and syndicators, because this is an awesome platform builder right here. So you are the master at this and it was and, and we, very well done. No, thank you. And we teach people how to market. We do like eight group calls just on marketing and building a list. It's huge. That's what I always say is I don't have an online program for that because most people won't succeed at it. And I got to go compete against all the noise in the marketplace of people that have never done it. And oftentimes, you know, I, I, I hear all the stories, right, from people that have paid. But, you know, we also, you know, I do, I give it in the books. That's where I teach everything I know. We're on calls. We'll have hour-long calls that go two hours if people are asking questions. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really a cool thing. Yeah, so I think if I, you are a connector, but I think what you really enjoy, the reasons you did the inner circle and the, um, the coaching is you really like to see the change in people. I think just even working with you a little bit, you see something, you see someone and you see the potential that person has, even though they don't really see it in themselves. And the reason is because you've seen so much. You're like, oh, publishing a book. Yeah, that's easy. Like, that's right. easy. And, and I'm like, it is? It goes, oh, yeah, it's easy. You can do it. I'm like, well, oh, Kyle thinks I can do it. Maybe I can do it. <laughs> and so you have someone like that, you know, speaking into you and that. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not put words in your mouth, but I think I see you light up when someone says, you know, uh, you know, even Tim Hubbard now is putting out his, right. I interviewed him, you know, and he's putting out his course and just, you know, great. That's fantastic. You take someone you know, and you're changing not only that person's life, but that person is now going to change thousands of other people. And that there's a lot of impact there. No, thank you. And Tim's a great example because a book causes you to own your story. And he was so diminishing his story. Most people diminish their story. Tim Cole, 31 year Colonel of the Marines, Seth Mosley, Tom Burns is a great example. You'll see Tom Thursday. Tom's raised $400 million. He's, you know, incredible guy, orthopedic surgeon. And, uh, you know, telling his story in the book just helped him start owning his story. But I'll say this, Michael, I think at my heart of hearts of hearts, I'm a promoter. And so I love talent. And when I see talent, I want to connect it with the right audience. And sometimes that's a one-on-one. -on -one, sometimes that's a group. Uh, Thursday at the Inner Circle, you're going to be sharing. And I was telling Nui Scruggs today, for people that don't know Nui, he's a seven-time Emmy-winning sportscaster. And he can only make it for part of the day because it's Dallas Cowboy football season. And he's the number one uh, station in town. I'm like, you, gotta, you can't miss Michael. Uh, Robert Helms is putting on his two-day event after this. He can only make half a day. I am scheduling Robert and Nui around your talk because I want them to hear your talk can't, you know, like it's, you are doing the deal. You're so powerful. And so that is inside of me where I want to connect people's talent with the right audience. And sometimes, like I said, that's a handful of people. Sometimes that's a million people, right? It's so, it's so powerful. And you're the master at that. And here's the thing. Everyone's got talent. Everyone's got that message inside of them. And Tim is a good, a lot of people like that. They don't think they have one. They think right. they're nobody. They think they don't have anything to say. They have no value to add. And it's all wrong. Right. right. Everyone can add value to every, some people, um, and you just have to dig deep enough and then just get the courage to get it out. And these books, for example, when someone puts a chapter in a book and you're like, Oh my gosh, now I'm in a book. Holy cow. I'm actually getting people responding to me and, and they're asking me questions. And <laughs> I'm like, all of a sudden, like I'm helping people, giving them advice. And it's just this eye opening thing. And I think more people need to do that because we can all help 
others in some way or another. So promotion is, is super critical. You can have this great talent, this great product, and you can lock it up in a box and it's <laughs> fantastic in this box, but it doesn't know any good. And yeah, so Michael. promotion is that missing piece, uh, Kyle, and, and you're that, you know, that missing piece to get that message out to the right audience. You know, I always say when I'm speaking, I say, how many people have a challenge putting themselves out there? And most people raise their most hands. Do, sure. And I do too. I'd like when I came out of retirement, I didn't want to, you know, I would post Jim Rohn quotes and not even dare say, oh, I was his 18 year business partner on social media. I so diminished who I was. And finally it hit me how much, the question I always ask people is how much influence do you want to have, right? If you want to just go hide, that's okay. But if you're going to put yourself out there, yes, you will get some people that will hate. You'll get some people that, you know, but it's very revealing. But once you step past that line of not caring, and it really truly is, how can I make, have more influence? Tom Burns can't even find deals, but if he finds one, it's already sold out. As, you know, there's, he's not writing a book to get more business. He can't, he doesn't know what to do with it, right? He's so, but what, it's this, it's this thing about influence. How much influence can I have? And watching, you know, Tim Humbert own his story. But part of it is you got to put yourself out there, right? You got to do that Facebook post. You got to do that Instagram post. You got to do that podcast post. You got to tell people about your opt-in and feel judged or whatever, but then have someone actually respond and say, thank you. Wow, that really helped me. Your interview on the podcast helped me. Your story made a difference. And then you say, okay, I'd rather have five of those than 30 that, you know, obviously are judging me, right? You know, it's so, it's so true. Uh, same thing for me. Uh, I, you know, I didn't think I had much to say after I did, you know, my first apartment building deal and people were like, oh, that's pretty cool. How'd you do that? And I started blogging about it. And people were like, that's really cool. How'd you do that? And I was like, all I did is a single deal, but I had one more deal than everybody else. And all of a sudden I could help that person achieve that first deal, right? So it's, it's not like you have to have this, you have to be this giant guru with decades of experience. Everyone has got, it can help someone in some way. 100%. Yeah, so speaking of your 52 lessons, because we talked about it a lot, how can people get those? Because they're really yeah. cool. Yeah, the easiest is just go to my website, kylewilson.com, and it's staring you in the face. Now, if you do it from your phone app, you might have to scroll down a little more, uh, but kylewilson.com. Also have over 100 blog posts on marketing and Jim Rohn. I have, if you, if you look hard enough on the, the homepage, you'll see all kinds of free resources of interviews with Darren Hardy, Brian Tracy you know, so forth and so on, downloadable books, all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. So it's so definitely go, go over to kylewilson.com right now. Okay. Maybe not if you're driving, but, but you know what I mean? Go right now and just, it, just sign up for it because not only will you learn from the actual 52 lessons, that's invaluable, but you'll see how, how Kyle quote markets to you. And it's, it's just in a very natural, non-aggressive way. Um, he also has these inner circle meetings that I go to several times a year. And, uh, and so I, I, I appreciate you, Kyle. I listen to almost everything you tell me and you <laughs> finally listen to me a little bit, which means you're, you're putting out a podcast, which should be live, uh, once this episode airs, I'll talk about that because uh, I can't wait to listen to that because I know who, you know, and you're going to spend, you know, 30, 60 minutes with the people. I'm going to listen to that. No, thank you, my friend. I, I do remember a year ago. Uh, when you came to the Ron White memory and marketing, he and I did, you, you said, dude, you got to do a podcast because I was interviewing people. Oh, you know, it's everybody. Been, <laughs> yeah. It, it's been on my list for three years and I held off uh, mainly because my, I've just been maxed and I, I want it to, when I launched it, I want it to really be able to, to do it the way I want it to do it. But yeah. I have amazing people lined up. Ryan Tracy said, yes, Mark Victor Hansen, chicken soup for the soul. Bill Collin of Def Leppard, Darren Hardy, Hal Elrod, who you introduced me to, who's amazing. And you're uh, going to be interviewing you and uh, really excited. And so again, they can get details at kylewilson.com on that too. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, I can't wait for that to be out. So, hey, Kyle, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm so impressed with everything you do. And on top of just getting so much done and being on top of things, you're just an incredibly generous guy too. You have the right philosophy. Uh, I, I have a lot of side conversations with people about you and everyone's in agreement. And so thank you. It's my honor. Really appreciate you and your friendship. 
Oh man, was that good or what? I could have chatted another hour with Kyle. He's just experienced so much. I learned so much from I was literally like, if you look at the video, it's literally scribbling notes as he was talking about these, you know, five pillars and the six principles of that. So hopefully you guys can keep up and we're gonna have the show notes obviously at themicablanc.com forward slash seven uh, session. 184 will be the show notes for that one. So if you couldn't write everything down, we'll try to grab it there as well. But so good. Definitely hand, uh, head over to kylewilson.com and sign up for his 52 lessons that he learned from Jim Rohn and other legends that he promoted. So much stuff there. And just get on his list and read the emails you're getting from him. So, so good. A master promoter. And again, this is something that you got to think about as well. As you start syndicating deals, really think about building a platform. And you really got to build it in the right way. You got to focus on building your email list. I see some people make that mistake. Again, we're going to talk about a lot more in the coming months, so stay tuned for that. I just want to have you guys thinking around building a platform. It's super, super important as well. Hey, um, if you haven't done your first deal yet and you want to know what it takes, I have a free webinar. It's at themichaelblank.com forward slash blueprint because it's a blueprint to financial freedom with your first apartment building deal. We're going to talk about how is it possible you can do this without any kind of experience or you're in cash. I'm just going to break it down step by step and show you how to do that. That's at themichaelblank.com forward slash blueprint. Appreciate you guys. Hope you find that valuable. Catch you on the next episode.